Evolutionists seem very confident in their calculations for the age of the Earth, but they seem to have overlooked the concentration of helium in Earth's atmosphere. At the current rate in which helium is released into the atmosphere from radioactive decay, we would see the current concentration in less than 10,000 years, coincidentally very close to the creationist age of the universe. How do the so-called scientists explain this and still adhere to their theory of billions of years? I had to investigate. An atom is a particular concentration of protons and neutrons bound together as a nucleus and representing a positive charge. It is often offset by a number of negatively charged electrons. When there is inequity in the number of protons and neutrons in the atom, it eventually sheds a combination of protons and neutrons until it finds a stable concentration. The most common combination of particles emitted is two protons and two neutrons. Known as alpha decay, this particular configuration is essentially a helium atom. On Earth, over 3,000 metric tons of helium are released into the atmosphere every year via radioactive decay while the sun also contributes a similar amount through solar or wind. Based on this, a noted creationist and chemist, Melvin A. Cook, published a paper in the 1957 issue of the journal Nature, noting that there is only enough helium in the atmosphere to account for a few tens of thousands to a couple millions of years. What Cook didn't take into account was the possibility of helium escaping the atmosphere. Three years later, in 1960, the satellite Discoverer 17 was launched into orbit and began measuring the escape gases from the Earth. Gordon J. F. MacDonald from the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics called together data from Discoverer 17 and published in the journal Science in 1962 and the Reviews of Geophysics in 1963. MacDonald noted the influx of helium and several other elements as well as their release into space. He found that the release of helium was virtually equal to the amount of influx also referred to as equilibrium. Helium is known as a noble gas, which means it doesn't readily form bonds with any other element. Although hydrogen is lighter than helium, it is constantly bonding with other elements, so effectively, helium is the lightest gas in our atmosphere. It is so light, in fact, that its buoyancy is enough to lift a blimp, which weighs over six tons. Because of the fact that helium is a noble gas, it is not impeded by other gases when it is released. Instead of languidly intermingling, helium simply rises. When rising, it is also heated by the sun and accelerates toward the sky. At about 60 kilometers above the Earth, helium and several other elements are exposed to solar radiation, which strips them of their electrons. Without electrons, these elements gain a positive electrical charge, essentially becoming ions. This is why the space between 60 and 1,000 kilometers up is known as the ionosphere. Being even lighter, the helium ions are accelerated beyond the ionosphere into the lower magnetosphere, where the pressure is low enough that the ions become plasma. This altitude is justifiably known as the plasmasphere. From here, the electrons making up the majority of the magnetosphere draw helium atoms even higher, where the solar wind sweeps them out of Earth's atmosphere and into space. As it turns out, the Earth's atmosphere receives about 40,000 tons of material each year from the Sun and ejects 50,000 tons. This same atmospheric depletion is seen on all of the planets and moons we've investigated in our solar system. For example, the atmosphere of Venus depletes at nearly twice the rate the Earth does. Eventually, the atmospheres of all the terrestrial planets will entirely deplete if the Sun doesn't destroy them first. For all of these reasons, although helium is the second most common element in the universe, accounting for 23% of its baryonic mass, it is statistically rare on Earth at only 5.2 parts per million. This in itself should be an indicator that atmospheric helium is going somewhere. In fact, the U.S. helium reserve accounts for roughly 30% of the world's helium, and it is expected to run out in 2018. And once again, we have another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.